I now call this meeting of the Davenport Community School District Board of Education to order. May we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Thank you very much for that. We'll def our mission and vision statements have been deferred to our student board members. Landon, could I please have you read the mission statement? Mission statement. The Davenport Community School District is dedicated to growing excellence in academics, the arts, and athletics for every child by ensuring the highest quality education in an environment shaped by our diverse community, preparing our students to be lifelong learners and productive citizens. Thank you. Lily, do you mind reading the vision statement? Vision statement. Education that challenges conventional thinking prepares all students to compete in, global, in a global society and inspires our students, parents, staff, and community to answer the question, what if? Thank you. Director Potts, do you mind reading the guiding principles? Guiding principles. Opportunity. We provide abundant opportunities to empower students to reach their full potential academically, creatively, and socially. Collaboration, we foster an environment that allows students, families, and community stakeholders to come together for the betterment of our students' education and future. Transparency, we share relevant and important information with our students, families, and community to maintain open and productive communication. Thank you very much for that. Superintendent Schneckloff, do you mind reading the goals? Uh, goal number six, bullying and harassment. The expectation is that PBIS will become a priority for each building. Thank you. You want to take recognitions and presentations? Thank Tonight you. we have a uh, fulfillment of a board request by Director Gordon to, uh, to discuss our complaint and grievance process in the district. And today we have Jabari Woods and Jamie Winesrow that are going to come up to the table and walk us through that. So thank you both for your preparation for tonight, and thank you for being here. Good evening. Thank you for allowing us to come tonight and present on the equity complaint process. Oops. Um, so for the table of contents, what we'll do is an overview <clears throat> and then a review of our grievance um, or complaint procedure and then the data that goes into um, or going into the data that we receive as people go through the formal process. So an overview, I started with a district in 2020, and at that time, one of our citations from the Department of Education was on our equity um, complaint process. So when I started, we updated board policies, administrative regulations, and put in a more user-friendly electronic complaint process, as well as a data keeping process. Um, so at any time, we can go in and look at any trends, look at buildings, look at the data um, that Director Gordon requested, and share that out. And I did list on the overview of the different board policies and administrative regs um, that are available for review. So to start off with uh, what's called as the grievance procedure, um, it's our formal complaint procedure. A person that wants to file a complaint can do so informally at any time, so that can be um, an employee or a parent that goes to the administrator at the building to voice their concerns. Or there's times when we look at the data where they start with our department and they haven't talked to anyone, um, to anyone at the buildings. So there are some times where we bring in both the administrator or the employee or the administrator and the family to have the conversation first to see if there's anything that we can resolve at that level um, before going through a formal complaint process. The person filing a complaint can make it formal at any time. So we'll start informally. If that's not working, then they can go and do our process that we're gonna share with everyone. Now, when it comes to sexual harassment or sexual assault, it 
we don't allow it to be an informal process. We ask administrators to bring all of that to our department to facilitate the investigation. So the first start or the first step within the grievance procedure is filing a complaint. And this all goes back to our board policies and um, administrative regulations. The person filing the complaint has 180 days from the event to do so. Now, if there is a complaint that's against myself or Jabari, then the superintendent would designate someone to do that investigation. If the investigate or if the complaint is against the superintendent, then we would look for an external third party to do that investigation. Um, and then the person that's filing the complaint um, in the paperwork, the electronic um, form, states the nature of the complaint and then also the remedy that they're requesting. So here's their problem and what would they like as the solution. The second step is the investigation phase. So within 15 days of the complaint, um, then the equity coordinator begins the investigation if the person is under the age of 18, uh, Jabari will get in contact with the parents or guardian before talking to the student. In the complaint, they need to identify themselves, identify any who the person is the respondent. So who is the person they have a complaint against and then disclose anything as far as um, witnesses that we can talk to or any social media, um, any emails, any evidence that they can provide at the time. So the investigation uh, may include, but is not limited to, um, the request for the written statement from the person filing the complaint, a request from the individual that um, the complaint is being <coughs> filed against, um, statements from the witnesses, additional interviews. Sometimes we get the witnesses in and there's more witnesses identified. Um, throughout the process, um, and then the review, full review and collection of all the information that has been provided to assess and deem if it's a founded, unfounded um, claim. And then within 60 working days, the equity coordinator uh, must complete the investigation and issue their findings. And then um, once they've issued the findings, then the equity coordinator needs to notify the complainant and the respondent of the decision within five working days of the completed written report. From there in step three, um, decision and appeal. So um, once Jabari um, or myself renders the findings, then if the person, the complainant, is not happy with those findings, they have 10 working days after receiving the decision uh, to put in a re written request to the superintendent appealing the decision. Then the superintendent has 30 working days to either affirm, reverse, or amend the decision um, or ask for further information um, from the equity department so that they can look into the details of the investigation. And then within five working days, the superintendent shall notify the complainant, respondent, and the equity coordinator of their decision. Uh, the decision of the superintendent is final. Um, and with the superintendent's decision, it does not take away from anyone going to file any other claims outside of the school district. Um, and then also in our policy retaliation against any person because they filed a complaint, assisted with or participated in an investigation is prohi prohibited. If anyone is found doing that, they are subject to disciplinary um, measures, which could be up to and including discharge. On here is a link to, let's see if it takes it. Oh, it didn't take it to our link. Oh, it's a PDF sheet, okay. Well, it's a link to our page on our website is the formal, um, under the equity link on the website is the electronic form that anyone can complete at any time. And that was part of the Department of Education's finding is that our um, forms weren't readily available or convenient for people to complete. So then into the grievance data. So I broke it up by year. So the first, like I said, the first year I was here was the first year we implemented this. So for the 2021 school year, we have um, a breakout of the types of complaints that we received. 
So we had harassment complaints, complaints about communication, compensation, job assignments, retaliation, and there weren't any claims of slander. You can see on the harassment, um, we had six founded complaints of harassment, and we had five unfounded claims of harassment. And then um, one of them we have is not applicable. That's where someone filled out a form stating harassment, but when you have a conversation with the person, it's not a situation that falls within harassment. It might be more of a meeting with the administrator um, to re-baseline um, sometimes communication or misunderstanding of job duties and expectations. Um, and that at any time we do a not applicable is that person can disagree with us and go down the formal path. This is often when we do that, they're like, okay, this just, I just needed some clarification or conversation, sometimes mediation, sometimes they just want another person to help facilitate a conversation with their supervisor or administrator because it can be an uncomfortable um, conversation. Uh, communication, we had um, unfounded, we had one that was closed. Whenever we close um, a complaint is because the person that filed the complaint quits responding to um, our requests for additional information. Um, so we <laughs> repeatedly ask and then give them a final notice. And then we only close it if they ever wanted to come back and open it, we would reopen it. Um, and then job assignment, um, we had a finding for a job assignment and retaliation. Then for employees for 21-22, there were two founded harassment claims and two unfounded. And then the breakout, um, the other ones were unfounded. So access um, and access to something that a person thought that they didn't have access to and it was just clarification, resolved it. Um, comments, sometimes comments are made by coworkers that um, can make us upset or make us uncomfortable. It doesn't always lead to um, discrimination or an equity type finding. In some of these cases, the comments aren't always warranted and we might go down more of a progressive disciplinary path with that person, but it doesn't really meet the terms or the definitions of <coughs> harassment or discrimination. Um, co compensation, one for dissatisfaction, um, job assignments, process, and then slander. Next, we get into the formal complaints. Um, I have it labeled as students, but typically it's the families that submit on behalf of the students. Um, so for, we had an unfounded on access. This was a situation with registration and a secretary wasn't available at the building at the time. We reached out to the person and was able to give them access and get that resolved. Um, and then you'll see the bullying and harassment is where we tend to get most of our complaints. Um, we had three founded complaints, three unfounded, and three of them that were reassigned to the building. When it's reassigned to the building, that's in agreement with the person that's filed the complaint. As I mentioned, there's times where we are the first stop instead of talking to the building. And so sometimes when it's dealing like a first incident of bullying or harassment, we wanna go back to the building and have the principal work with the family on maybe a safety plan or you know, start there first. And then if that doesn't work, then we'll get the ILD involved and we'll be involved. But in these situations, we work with them. The families are good going back to the building to try and resolve it and get a plan in place for their student. Again, we always leave it open that they can come back and bring it back to us at any time. Um, an IEP situation, um, and then we have in the policy and process, they were, we had an unfounded, we had a reassigned to the building and one that wasn't applicable. Mm -hmm. And then one was a threat that was reassigned to a building. Um, it wasn't one that would have met the definition. It was something that just needed to be, we don't, if they're serious, we're not just reassigning them. And sometimes those threats are outside of um, the school building and trying to work with the families on getting that resolved. And then for 21-22, um, again, we had another couple access um, complaints and then still the bullying harassment. Um, you can see we had some that were founded, some that were unfounded, a lot reassigned to the building. 
um, and then um, a couple that were closed. And again, when they stopped communicating, uh, communicating with us or responding to us, we close it until we hear back from them. Um, some fighting situations, um, inappropriate contact. Um, so we had a finding, an unfounded, and um, a closed. Another process, another threat, and then some truancy. And then from there, what we have here, I'm gonna get my actual data out. So this is a comparison of the employee and student retention. So under, we'll start with employees. Under employees for the 2021 20, school year, and we're looking at a total, so for out of everyone who filed a complaint, 56% of those people had left the district. So for 2021, there were 18 complaints, or for employees, um, 18 complaints and 10 resignations. And then um, part of the board request was, you know, what's the percentage of those that um, receive an unfounded complaint that leave the district? So 57% of employees who received an unfounded complaint left the district. So we had seven people received an unfounded complaint and four of them resigned. If we get down to 21-22 school year, 38% of employees who filed a complaint left the district. So that would have been, we had 16 complaints and six resignations. And then out of the, for the unfounded, 43% of employees who received an unfounded claim left the district. So there were 14 unfounded claims with six resignations. Then on the student side, we have 27% of students who filed a complaint left the district, and those raw numbers are 15 complaints and four students no longer enrolled. And then on the 14% of students who received an unfounded complaint left the district, and there were 14 unfounded complaints with two no longer enrolled in the district. If we drop down to 21, 22, 4% of students who filed a complaint left the district. So we had 47 complaints with two no longer enrolled. And then 15% of students who received an unfounded claim left the district. So we had 13 unfounded complaints with two students no longer enrolled in the district. So from there, any questions? Direct Gordon. Thank you so much for taking the time to put that together and present it. I do appreciate it. Um, I do have a few follow-up questions. Um, how, first of all, how is um, complaint data stored and like how long do you guys keep records of, of those types of things? Sure. So the difficult thing, as I mentioned, was when someone fills out, we have a Google form. So whenever they fill out the form, it or whenever yeah, whenever they fill out the form, it goes into a database, and we save that database. And these would probably have to be I'd have to double check either five to seven years from the closure of the complaint. Um, but prior to my time was part of our citation, so I I think we have some things lying around. They weren't stored in a database where it's easy for us to go back and look at all the information. Have you encountered a situation where there's been multiple claims against one person over time, and how is that handled in the district? Sure. You want to go ahead? It occurs, but I would say we go through the same process that you walked through tonight with. I wouldn't call it an ABC chart, but if we had third, fourth offenders of the same issue, progressive disciplinary models is what we abide by with board policy. So the same things happen, handled the same way. A person may come back with a different complaint, but the same individual. And then before it's done, progressively, they've been disciplined accordingly. Sometimes that ends in termination. Sometimes it ends in a reprimand. Sometimes it ends in going to a certain training. That's kind of been the process. And one thing Jamie alluded to, um, our, our data that was shown before our audit, it really didn't have the transparency you have now. So the documentation, the complaint form that Jamie came in and implemented gives anybody in our district and outside our district access to complete it online. So they're not writing a scribble piece of paper and trying to get it to us. 
and it allows me to get a stamp to look at it, make sure we're following up accordingly. And to piggyback on what Jabari was talking about on the progressive disciplinary side, once there's an investigation and if there's a finding and it does deal with another person in the district, then we take that and go through a progressive disciplinary process. And then if it's repeated, then it does depend on does that, does it lead to unpaid time off? Does it lead to termination? The challenge a lot of times in whether it's the employee filing the complaint or the family is we can't share with the other person how we've handled the situation and would definitely love to because I think that's what people want to see is what's the remedy. Um, but due to the law, we can't share that confidential information. So that, that leads into actually a couple of my other questions. I wanted to look back at something real quick. Um, so everything that comes through is considered informal except for sexual harassment and sexual claims unless they say otherwise, or can you explain that one a little bit better? Yeah. The no. So if there were to be any report of sexual harassment or sexual assault, if a parent were to call the school or if someone in the building, an employee were to tell their administrator um, something that dealt with sexual harassment or sexual assault, it couldn't just be an informal process. Administrators are told they have to automatically come to us to complete the investigation. Anybody at any time so in, uh, can do a formal complaint. So if we treat it as formal when they submit the complaint. The ones that are reassigned to the building, that's a conversation with the family and they agree for that to happen. So an informal one would be really if there's, I mean, because really it, we don't just pass it off. Sometimes there's complaints that people that don't file a formal complaint that'll call our office and seek some guidance. And sometimes it's a matter of just getting some of the right people involved in the situation to help resolve it. And then we, again, we always tell them if it's not resolved, they always can come back to us at any time. They can jump out of whatever process, informal process they're working on through the school buildings and come back to us. Um, I think this is my last question for now, unless I come up with something else. Um, so the complaints that don't end up coming to you, the people that do follow the the chain of command and start at the building level, and you know, how are we compiling that data? How are we certain that the complaints that are going to a principal are being addressed by the principal? And if they're not being addressed by the principal, how are we certain that they're being addressed by the ILD? Like since there's not a, a link on the web page of each school district to make sure that those are tracked. So from an equity department standpoint, that's the formal process. So if somebody, I encourage anyone that feels like their um, complaints not being resolved at the school or with the ILD to go fill out the formal complaint. We don't know what we don't know. And so the formal complaint, the informal complaint process is down at the school level. The formal complaint process is an escalation to our department. So again, really anyone that doesn't feel that they're being heard at the building or at any other level um, within leadership, I encourage them to submit a complaint. Okay, I do have one more question then. Um, what is it, I know that you go through the process of the questioning of, of the people involved in whatever in order to figure out if something is founded or unfounded, but I guess I still don't quite understand like if, like what, what makes up something being unfounded, I guess. If someone is saying this happened and somebody saw it or, or heard it or whatever, but it how does that work out? So in our office, we call it a objective, woven objectivity. So you're investigating something with objectivity. What ends up happening when it ends up to lead and confound it, preponderance of evidence is not, doesn't exist. 
So you got a lot of information, but as you broke it down and you fact find, you didn't get enough to substantiate the claims. Doesn't mean the person's lying, doesn't mean it didn't happen, but doesn't give us enough to say that it's confirmed. Unfounded really comes when there's not enough to confirm it, but even if it's unfounded, there's a building conversation with building leadership, ILDs, to make sure that that environment, whatever happens, doesn't happen again. I think, and I'm going back prior to an audit and having a complaint process, what I believe has happened now with leadership with ILD structure from our superintendent down, the communication's open. So you have an ILD that's gonna jump on something that the principal needs to make a step, they're gonna revisit that with them to get that step done, or her to get it done. If that works, they move on, but they're still reporting out how it what took place. Two weeks go by, a month goes by, and it's still happening, then they move it up and now we're investigating at the district level. And a lot of it is parent-led too. A parent may not be satisfied with what an ILD said or a principal said, that's okay. You know, in our culture, you can still submit a complaint and we go do it formally. I would say sometimes it comes out differently, but always there's some kind of resolution where the parent feels like there's something that's different that happened the first time. That answers your question. Can I piggyback on that too? Sure. Is within your question, there's oftentimes where in an unfounded situation where it could be we're given witnesses to talk to, and when we talk to those witnesses, their statements don't reflect the person's statements that made the complaint. So oftentimes, the information doesn't line up. So, thank you so much for answering all the questions. Director Beck. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you for explaining this process. I know, um, well, I guess I have one short question and one longer question. So you guys go through special training to investigate um, <clears throat> these, right? So it's not like you're just showing up with a clipboard and asking questions of people. It's a it's a formalized process, correct? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess my question then would be um, – one thing that we heard about a lot, particularly before our citations, was people, um, employees in particular, feeling like they were being retaliated against. How do you go about documenting that? Is the process the same? Is the investigation the same? Um, how do we make it so that employees feel comfortable filing a complaint if they need to? Um, can you speak to that just a smidge? Sure, so I'll jump on that one. Sure. Um, if you saw in our data over the past two years, we had one claim of retaliation and it was founded. Um, again, we don't know what we don't know and I encourage people, if they feel that they've been retaliated, then submit a complaint and we follow the investigation. Retaliation should not happen and we will hold people accountable like we would hold people accountable for anything else. But you have to say something, you know, Director um, Could you just explain to me how truancy is a complaint? I mean, did they say the district said this kid's truant and the parents disagreed? Or how does truancy become a complaint? In that one, it was a situation in those where you have students that are truant and you have the parents that are upset that they're being called upon or trying to be held accountable for getting their kids to school and they feel that they're being harassed. That's what they labeled it as. So I didn't manipulate any of the information. I put it in as it was as the person coded it in our system. Um, one other short question. Um, so um, can you explain the official definition of harassment? in this context, because I think my mother was an employment, <laughs> equal employment lawyer. Um, I think it's different from what we typically understand. And then could you also clarify what communication means on your tables here? Yes, okay. so the harassment, and a lot of times when you see unfounded, it's because it didn't meet the leg legal definition of harassment. So harassment, um, harassment and sexual harassment is typically if somebody says something to you that offends you um, and then you tell them to stop and it continues and then it starts creating a hostile work environment then that starts leading into harassment 
Um, some of the communication ones were around how somebody talked to somebody or a comment that was made that they didn't like. It doesn't necessarily meet harassment, but it could be someone's communication style. It could be the way in which they talked to someone. It could have been their tone. So a lot of times... It doesn't meet the definition of harassment, but as Jabari mentioned, we circle back to address it so it doesn't escalate into something bigger. Any additional questions? Director Gordon. How, how private is the whole process, like outside of your department? Is TJ aware of what happens with complaints and stuff? Is, are the ILD, like how involved are other staff members outside of the HR department? So when the investigation's occurring, the people that need to know, no. Um, because sometimes Jabari's going to have to pull... Um, pull people from the buildings or Jabari is going to show up there and people are going to question why is he here. Um, but it's on an as need to know basis. Once the investigation is finalized and Jabari does his written, um, written report, then that's sent off to the superintendent and the ILD in that region. So they're aware of what had occurred. So then if, Sorry, I'm circling back to something from earlier. If the complaints at the building level or the ILD level are not um, always equity related and so they don't always make it to you or whatever, if there was going to be a way that we established there to be a formal documentation for that, even just even just so that principals can keep track of you know timelines of things or whatever, what department would handle that? So if you have... Are you talking from an employee perspective, like an employee was either either way, like families or, and or employees, maybe separate things. Like no, I to think. Set up. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a bullying harassment task force that Courtney is leading that I believe is working on a tool to be used at the building level. Jackson. Thank you, uh, Gordon. I was going to ask about the uh, definition of unfounded. Um, oh, God. What was I? Did I already forget what I was going to ask? Oh, yeah, I remember. Um, so when it comes to uh, received and unfounded complaints, the, the statistic on employees that left from receiving an unfounded complaint, I, I assume that's referring to the person who was accused of something, or is that the person who submitted the complaint? It's the person that submitted the complaint. Okay. Great question. Any additional questions? Thank you so much for that presentation. Thank you for letting us come and share it. Thanks. Student board reports time, and I do believe we'll ask our local celebrity, Landon, who was in the paper today. Was anybody else on the board in the paper today? Just you? That was pretty cool waking up to read the paper and seeing you in the paper today, Landon. So <laughs> we'll start there and work our way down. All right. Uh, this is school report for North. We're all from North here, so we kind of broke it up. Um, our student council has been hard at work raising money in cans for the student hunger drive. Uh, we're really proud to report that through fundraisers at Pizza Ranch, Fairway, and Hy-Vee, we have raised over $1,350. That's over 2,000 pounds of food or almost 7,000 meals for hungry families in our community and our region. Aside from monetary funds raised, we have also collected several, several boxfuls of cans. So we're really excited about that. Uh, green teams from DCSD uh, high schools met this Sunday, the 23rd, to pull weeds at the tree nursery on Eastern Avenue, owned by Living Lands and Waters. Uh, the QC Times wrote a lovely article, uh, if you would like to read more about that. This is the first time that all of the green teams have worked together on a project, and we're hoping to have many more projects in the future. Uh, at North... Uh, Mrs. Laura McCreary's environmental science students put together action projects that they presented at North on Monday the 17th. 
I got to see many wonderful pres uh, presentations on topics ranging from water conservation to phantom energy to recycling and litter management. Uh, there are a lot of great ideas there shared, and I'm hoping to see more of those uh, as we go on. Regarding our fall sports, Wildcat Cross Country Team just finished their 2022 season on Tuesday night at Crow Creek Park in Bettendorf. Our top girls finisher, Gabby Liebold, ran a 22-minute and 25-second um, 5K. And our top boys finisher, Grant w Wies, I believe, uh, made a new personal record, finishing in under 18 minutes. Overall, they had an amazing season, and they're really excited for their next, um, next year. Student Council is holding a volleyball tournament on November 1st at 6 p.m. in our big gym to gather donations for our student hunger drive. Visitor entry for the tournament is $3 or five cans. And they will also be holding a fun night on the 28th from 5 to 7 p.m. open for any and all students um, and young children. There will be a showing of Hotel Transylvania in the big gym and we'll have games and food in the gym lobby. Admission will be $3 or five cans. All right. Uh, and then this past Saturday, we sent our choir students, band students, and orchestra students to Allstate. We sent seven choir ensembles, five orchestra students, and four band students to audition. Um, the music was really hard this year, but they practiced really hard for it. Uh, choir had three students accepted and one called back. Orchestra had three students accepted, and band had one accepted for the highest level band orchestra. Um, our drama club just started rehearsal for our children's play, uh, musical. It's High School Musical Junior. Uh, we'll be showing December 11th and 12th at 2 p.m. And then we will also be doing an all-day children's workshop that Saturday for children who want to have fun and learn more about the theater. Uh, more information of that will be posted on the Troop Instagram just very shortly. Uh, and they get to come uh, make costumes, do face paint, and then they get to go watch the show and even like do a performance before the show. It's really fun. Uh, and then also for kids 6th through 12th grade, we will be having a camp for our upcoming musical Newsies. Um, it'll be November 3rd and 4th. That'll also be on our Instagram at troop3449. Three, at three, nine, troop3994. Um, you can either learn the choreography and music for the show uh, and stage combat and all that stuff, or you can go the technical track and learn how we program our lights and do our sound for the shows. Uh, that'll be $25 per person, and you get a t-shirt, uh, lunch, and two days of that full workshop. Yeah. All right, then over at the west side of the aisle, we've got uh, we had a unified bowling uh, district event on October 6th. Uh, down at Leisure Lanes, and uh, Stephanie Reagan uh, heading that, our counselor. And we had seven pairs participate, with two of them qualifying for state in November. So uh, that's going to be pretty uh, pretty cool. I think uh, first school in uh, Davenport to achieve that. And then at uh, Cross Country, uh, Kylie Daly, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, has moved on to state. This will be... Uh, uh, I believe this week in uh, Fort Dodge, and uh, she had also uh, achieved a medal at every meet of the uh, of the season. And then, uh, uh, where'd it go? Then the uh, last thing I just got right now, we finally got this year's uh, first edition of the Beacon Eye out. That's the West High School newspaper. Uh, and just to interject a little bit of personal opinion here, I, I, I'm not too sure how it looks at the, uh, the other schools, but one of the things I've noticed about especially the Beacon Eye at West is um, really anything goes. It doesn't just need to be school-related events. It can be uh, you know events going on in the world, um, even like political events in the country. Um, it, it really is, um, it, it's sort of the uh, epitome of, of allowing students creativity and uh, their, their sort of freedom of speech to flourish, uh, even at the high school level. And it, it, it honestly is one of, my, one of my favorite things about, about being at West. I don't, know, I don't know if you guys do it or if Central does it, but yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and then on the Central side, uh, Central's music students were successful at all state auditions with five band students, an orchestra student, and 14 vocal students being accepted as all state music musicians this year. And then we also had two runners from our cross country team, Marin Crowder and Dylan Muller, make it to state. And this is the first time that we've had multiple cross country runners make it to state since 2005. And then another fall sport, our swim team defeated Moline last week, and the junior varsity will compete in the JV invite this weekend at Muscatine. And then finally, our stu student council will also be doing a dodgeball tournament this Wednesday to raise money for our student hunger drive. Our drama club is performing their play Steel Magnolias on November 8th, 9th, and 10th. And the production will also be presented at the University of Northern Iowa State Thespian Competition. Recently, Central had seven ninth grade students selected for the 36th Opus Honors Choir Festival and two Sudlow students. And then from our feeder schools, the Creative Arts Academy junior high students have a fall festival to showcase all of their work um, on the 27th at Sudlow. And the Creative Arts is also starting to accept audition applications starting November 1st. Thank each one of you for your reports. Are there any board reports? That's a question. Director Beck. Um, well, uh, <laughs> you stole a couple of mine. Um, I was going to talk about the Fall Fest. Um, I had the pleasure, along with I think several of us, attending the Band Spectacular. Um, what was it? It's been a week and a half now. And that was just amazing. Um, and uh, my four-year-old was dancing in his seat. He loved it so much. Um, <clears throat> and then um, I also attended the Central High Masquerade Orchestra performance. Um, <laughs> and uh, we have one excellent board member who performed. Um, and then also um, Sudlow performed, and then there were three orchestras from Central that performed um, uh, the ninth grade orchestra, the chamber orchestra, and then the 10th through 12th grade orchestra, and then everyone performed together. And I have to say, our the Central High orchestras are amazing. It was a great show. It was a lot of fun. Um, and it was also the world premiere of one of our teachers, uh, Mr. Svenevig's uh, a piece he wrote and was the world premiere of that piece. And I'm totally blanking on the name this year, but so we have composers in our ranks as well. Thank you. Director Gordon. Uh, two, Saturday, two Saturdays ago, I had the pleasure of going to the state band competition at Muscatine High School and got to watch um, Central and West and North marching bands compete and Every single band just blew it out of the water. Like, very, very proud of our high school bands this year. They were really neat to watch. Superintendent Schneckler. This is from President Goza, who could not be here tonight. But President Goza wanted to wish T.J. Ogden from North a speedy recovery as he um, had a very tragic event at the football game on Friday. He is recovering, but President Goza wanted to send his best wishes along with the school board to, to TJ at North. Thank you for that. I would also like to express the board's condolence to the Terrell family. Um, one of the Terrells is over at West High in security. They lost their father in the last couple of weeks here. And I just want to offer our condolence from the board. Moving on to communications, we're in open forum now. Open forum is a time for members of the community to give their input at a board meeting regarding school district issues and concerns. Individuals who want to speak, please fill out an open forum request and give it to the board secretary prior to open forum. The forum is available in hard copy for in-person attendees or on the school board page of the district website for those who want to participate virtually. Virtual participants must email their request to Brenda T at, Bren, at tbren at 
www.ethicsmith.org by 3 p.m. on the day of the board meeting. The board will not act on any issues presented during open forum if it is not published on the agenda item. Iowa Open Meetings Law prohibits actions on any issues that is not on the agenda. I will set the amount of time allowed for each individual to speak. The board asks that no charges or complaints be made against individual employees of the district or community. Remarks that reflect negatively on the character or motives of any person will be called out of order. You will be asked to state your name and home address prior to making remarks. To participate virtually, call 312-626-6799 and enter the meeting ID number 9403726. 5653 in the passcode is 829013. I have 16 requests. You'll each be given two minutes. Director Potts will be the timekeeper for the request. And when you hear your time go off, if you could kind of wrap up that final sentence there, that would be greatly appreciated. We'll call two at a time to come up, and please remember to state your name and your address. We'll have Brian Magler, Magler and Brent Puck, and I apologize in advance if I do not get those names correct. Just hit that button right there. Good evening, thank you for having us. <clears throat> I'm Brian Mengler, uh, live at 351 East Memorial Road in Walcott. I'm a longtime uh, park board member, commander of the Walcott Legion, Walcott Day member, and past Walcott Day volunteer fireman. <clears throat> I'm here to talk about the possible school closings. Um, my family moved to Walcott in 1973 when I was 11. We made several trips from Cedar Rapids to towns around Davenport and decided Walcott was for us. Knowing there was an elementary and junior high school back then was the biggest selling point. Both my parents worked so we would walk to school, rain, snow, or shine, and ourselves by ourselves, knowing that everyone looked out for each other in this town. My wife and I have had three kids grow up here also. They enjoyed walk at school and felt like the staff were family, and we got to know just about all the teachers. The kids enjoyed walking and meeting up with their friends to go to school and walking home also. The same goes as for today. We have organizations like Hearts and Hands back 10 or more years ago that applied for grants and town donations to build a bike and rec trail that would connect Walcott Estates with our town so the children could get to school safely without having to walk on the highway. A new playground was recently donated by many of our town's organizations for the Walcott Elementary Playground. Our town and many organizations have in recent years built a splash pad, put new playground equipment in two of our five parks, renovated both ballparks, and are working on more. My wife and I have been blessed with a grandson this year. My son remodeled a house in Walcott and moved in last November. He and his wife picked Walcott because of the many attributes of living in a small town and having an elementary school. Things haven't changed much except for all the improvements that have been done by the city and organizations to attract young families to our town. The school is the town's heartbeat. Not having concerts, fun nights, grandparents' days, parents' days, at the school and seeing the kids walking to and from school having fun together would be a shame. Our community has worked hard together making it inviting to young families and losing one school will recently hurt us. I think we need to keep our school as is. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Brent Puck, 533 South Main in Walcott. Uh, we didn't compare notes beforehand, but you'll hear some similar themes. Um, uh, I'd like to start by maybe going back to the classroom for a minute. Um, a keystone species is such that uh, the population has an overwhelmingly um, in large influence on the ecosystem in biology. And uh, examples of a keystone species would be um, uh, wolves in the West, Bees have been identif identified as a keystone species, um, and numerous others. I learned all this from my daughter, a senior at West, in um, Mr. Gassi's biology class. Um, but the key here is that uh, 
these species are needed for the health of the entire ecosystem. I'd like to make the case that Walcott Elementary is a keystone institution in our community because of what it contributes. And the largest part of that is bringing in new residents uh, that can become involved in the community. So that includes um, young families that uh, their children become involved in our youth sports, they become involved in our scouting and 4-H, and the families then become members of our community organizations, our volunteer organizations. Um, probably the largest of which, uh, as far as importance, is our volunteer fire department. These are the, the people that are starting uh, their volunteer work in our community and are really priceless. So I currently serve as the, the uh, uh, president of the Hearts and Hands Foundation, and we just in this last two months had three new members join that fit this mold. New to the town, uh, they came to the town for the school, and they're becoming involved in the community. These kids uh, uh, attend walk at school and, or will be attending. Uh, they're pre-K right now. So uh, it's a, kind of important uh, for us. All that being said, I merely wanted to say that uh, you know, the Walcott Elementary School, um, it would have se serious negative repercussions for it to close to our community. Um, this might be a small part, but it is a keystone institution that's very important for our community. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, next we have Joe Aubrey and Kim Himlet. Uh, my name is Joe Aubrey. I live at 225 North Downey Street in Walcott, Iowa. Um, I'd like to highlight something that President Gosa said at a meeting in July that really resonated with me. I'm paraphrasing, but he said he stated that he bought a home for his family based on the school. Um, in general, I think that is probably a top item on a lot of young families lists when looking for a home. This is the same reason many younger families choose Walcott, my own included. Uh, if that option is taken away, the, our community loses that level of attractiveness. Many parents in our town will likely stay, endure and ship their children to bluegrass as proposed by the FMPC. Um, some will leave or open and roll elsewhere. Uh, the big takeaway is I want to emphasize that closing the elementary will certainly prevent people from considering walkout in the future, stifling our community growth. <clears throat> Sorry, this is a little disjointed. I just had a few bullet point items I wanted to talk about. Um, on Friday, the Iowa Board of Education released their school performance results for the 21-22 school year. I haven't had a lot of time to dig into it and the site was a little spotty on availability yesterday. But uh, one thing that I noticed was that Walcott has the highest overall sco score for the district. Uh, Bluegrass and Buffalo are also both in the top five. Either design from the FMPC recommendations aimed to dismantle the successful programs in Western Scott County for the sake of district uniformity to make a K-4, K-5, and a you know, elementary model and a 5-8 or 6-8 intermediate model. Um, one other thing here, the uh, future enrollment analysis presented by Bray Architects points to enrollment growth for the Western Scott County schools over the next 10 years. I would urge you to consider that during your decision making process. Uh, that's really all I have. How much time do I have left, Potts? Five seconds. Um, Schneckloth, thanks for, thanks for wearing blue in support. I'm so short. Okay. There we go. My name is Kim Hewlett. I'm at 245 North Main Street in Walcott. Two weeks ago, I was here. I shared my personal story of moving to the area, but this week I'm thinking more about a larger issue that may affect our district. Um, which is enrollment. Um, I think the survey for long-term facilities planning is meant to address the overall steady declining enrollment, and I fear that the actual pathways presented to the community may only lead to an even deeper deficit of students leaving the district. According to both pathways in the survey, 
closing existing elementary school, school buildings is listed as part of phase one. But unfortunately for parents, no specific schools are listed and no, nor are the schools that will be accepting students from the closed schools mentioned. So this leaves, leaves us all kind of wondering how to proceed, what rumors to believe, uh, do we leave it up to the district to decide where our kids will go, if they'll stay with their friends or get bused elsewhere? Um, or will we make a decision to open enroll our students in a neighboring district who are happily willing to accept many of our students? In addition, when creating intermediate schools that all look similar and uniform in order to right size at the intermediate level, what happens to the unique programming that's uh, available at each school now? The Creative Arts Academy out of Sudlow Junior High currently houses 108 artistically minded middle schoolers. And I'm worried, does right sizing eliminate this unique opportunity for the sake of equity? Will moving our fifth and sixth grade students to junior high levels take away from special programming that's offered at many junior highs for seventh and eighth graders, like computer programming, consumer sciences, partnerships with, with trades and auto industries? And without more information and specifics, I'm finding that the survey is confusing and a little closed off to the community, which makes me worried. It makes me wonder if families will just feel better off moving elsewhere. The DCSD website states that the district provides a holistic education that emphasizes the social and emotional wellness of every child in capital letters. Um, so I just wanna highlight that. Um, I, I'm, I'm fearful that if the district does not explore a pathway that keeps Walcott Elementary open, I fear that many parents will be forced to find a school or district whose actions speak louder than the website's words. Thanks for your time. Brittany Roseman and Amy Hambly. Hello, I'm uh, Brittany Roseman. I live at 423 West Parkview Drive in uh, Walcott. We are one of those families um, that recently moved to Walcott. And to be honest, I did not want to move at all. We lived in Davenport. I had no interest in moving. And the only reason that I agreed was because of the way their school is set up. Um, they have this interesting continuity of care where my kids could go there from kindergarten all the way up until they leave for high school. Um, they have the familiarity of the teachers even above them so that by the time they get up to them, they're familiar with their faces. They know their names. They know where all of their lockers are. It's this continuity of care, sorry, um, that keeps the kids' stress levels down. Their test scores are higher. Um, and ultimately, I think what everybody's been saying about bringing in the younger families, I've got two of my own. Uh, there's three more just within two houses next to me that are coming up and uh, came there just for the school. And you might not see it with the enrollment rates now, but there are a lot of younger children who within the next few years will be filling that school if you allow it. So I know financially something has to be done, but I do urge you to look into any other avenue that doesn't affect the quality of our education and that continuity of care. Thank you. I'm Amy Hamby. I live in Stockton, Iowa. This is my five-year-old, Carson. And I am a single mom. And what offers at Walcott is a community that we have been absolutely supported by. And by moving the elementary school that will disrupt his world along with many, many other kids. Last time I was here, you guys had the presentation on the app and how big of an importance it was to always be available to these kids, always be supportive. Well, that is what Walcott is. And pulling an elementary school out of there will disrupt their entire worlds. Right now, he's only five years old. But I can tell you in this room, he has his preschool teacher, one of five that is standing here, 
You've seen me on the floor playing with him and my community standing behind me, including my sister, friends that live in Walcott, everybody that's supporting us. And if I have to pull him from Davenport out to Durant, which is where his home school district is, I have to disrupt that. And it's the last thing I want to do as a mother of a five-year-old. He already just has me. I don't need to disrupt it anymore. By pulling an elementary school out of a community such as Walcott, you are pulling every single support team away from these kids. We've had our kindergarten teacher pulled. The class size is doubled. We've had the second grade teacher pulled into another school. Again, doubling a class size. That is detrimental to the kids. I have Carson here tonight. It's no fun bringing a five-year-old to these meetings. But in my line of work, I have to follow this nice little plan that says everybody belongs in this group. But then when they don't belong in that group, I get to present for their problems, their needs. And then an insurance company decides on it. Here's Carson. Here's his needs. He is not a dollar sign. He's not a student. This is a child and his life. Cora Madsen and Sam Shores. Hello, my name is Cora Matson, 244 West Lincoln Street, Walcott, Iowa. I'm a current fourth grader student at Walcott Elementary School. I have a younger sister, Lucy, who is in first grade. Our little brother will start kindergarten in the fall of 2024, and he hopes to be able to go to the same school as his big sisters. Our dad grew up in Walcott and enjoyed attending Walcott School through eighth grade. Our mom grew up moving around and attending more than 10 schools before going into high school. When they decided to raise their family and make Walcott their home, the school and the community that stands behind the students and the school were a huge factor in their decision. I want to be able to go to school with my siblings and my friends. We enjoy being able to walk to school with our friends. We enjoy the relationships that the teachers have built with us. As teachers and as community volunteers, we succeed in Walcott because the students, parents, and teachers work together and support each other. I want my brother to go to Walcott School with me and my sister. If you make the decision to close the school, my parents will be faced with the decision to continue in the Davenport District. We do not want to change schools. What you would be taking from Walcott's community is far more valuable than any dollar you may save by closing Walcott Elementary. Please leave Walcott School alone and use us as an example of success in the Davenport Dav <laughs> Community School District. Thank you. Um, Sarah Swartz, uh, 235 West Cedar Lane in Walcott. Um, at the last meeting and a few other times, we've heard from members of the board, um, and I felt like they were not respecting the levels of education and intelligence um, when we were asking questions. And it's not a you know, bad thing or anything like that. It's just how I was feeling. Um, at first, I was kind of angry, but then I remembered what I tell my girls. Stop, breathe, and think. So I thought, and I decided maybe we all needed to take a step back and remember some early lessons. The first being that a square peg does not fit in a round hole. That round hole being the inner city school dynamic and that square peg being our rural school and our rural kids. They're built differently. 
They just don't fit that round hole that you're that we're trying to shove them into. I tell my kids daily that it's okay to be different. My second lesson is one in economics, because after all, it's about the money and not always about the kids. In my 15 years in business, I learned that we do have to close branches, schools sometimes, that, but it typically doesn't mean that you close an underperforming school, but according to the state of Iowa, we're proposing to close some of our best performing schools, that being Walcott Elementary. My third lesson is that in insanity. Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result is insanity. As a district, we've closed six elementaries and one junior high in the last 25 years, all to save money and make the district better. But here we are again. Sometimes moving forward, we need to take into account what has happened in the past and not try to fit that square peg in that round hole. Thank you. Nathan Carbo and Lon Warnick. My name is Nathan Cable, 306 East Meadow Lane, Walcott. I'm a Walcott resident with two children in Walcott Elementary School, grades six and third. I was raised in Devonport and grew up going through the Devonport Community Schools, having attended Wilson, Frank L. Smart, and West. The mission statement posted on the Devonport Community Schools website reads, to enhance each student's abilities by providing a quality education by our diverse community. I hope the irony isn't lost on anyone that we're here discussing the closure of an closure of an elementary school due in part to it being different. And yet I don't see anything in the mission statement about providing education as cost effectively as possible. I've heard the praise regarding filling buckets, silos, coffers, and things of the sort. So I ask is the aim to provide the best possible education, full stop, or to provide the best education with the caveat of saving money wherever possible. A decision needs to be made if we have a mission statement or a mission goal. I don't see room for both. The Walcott community had a town hall meeting and a member of the Davenport Community School Board was able to attend. I sincerely thank you for taking your time and making yourself available. They brought up a concern about rumors. To this I would say in the absence of a confirmed fact, rumors are usually sanctified as truth. In the absence of information and facts, rumors will begin to take hold and be perceived as truth. The information Walcott residents have asked for has not been provided. This is especially concerning if people are to be kept aware of events taking place. Several parents have asked repeatedly for more information about the rejected plans, as well as how the school's occupancy was calculated by Bray Engineering. I think failing to address these requests and provide these materials is tantamount to lying, standing in direct opposition to the school board's claims of being transparent. Currently, Walcott is a middle school for the Buffalo, Bluegrass, and Walcott communities, in addition to serving as Walcott Elementary School. What is the propo proposed plan for utilizing nearly half of the school if the elementary were to be removed? I speculate that due to the proposed closure of Frank L. Smart, students from the west end of Davenport would be bused to Walcott. In light of the recent issues surrounding the busing system for the Davenport School District, I believe the risks of this plan have become abundantly clear. This process has been referred to as one of the most significant decisions facing the school district and will establish the future of the district for the next 15 to 20 years. It seems that due to the lack of planning information, this is not the right plan moving forward. I urge the school board to revisit their plans affecting the schools. Lon Warnicky, 346 West Durant Street in Walcott. I want to thank each one of you for serving on the board. I know it's not an easy assignment. I attended Walcott School K through ninth back before we had four year high school. Had three children that went K through eighth at Walcott. All of us West High grads. Um, I have a granddaughter growing up in Walcott. My son and daughter-in-law moved back from serving in the military to Walcott to raise their child in a small town and to go to Walcott School. That's one of their main reasons. Um, hopefully there'll be more grandchildren going to Walcott School also. Uh, one of the biggest thing is the Walcott School District. It's big for the city, it's big for families. I'm one of uh, eight kids. All of us went K through ninth at Walcott. Families will grow, families will come to Walcott School. Um, 
As a parent, your goal is to always raise your kids to be more successful as you. I feel I've done that with my three children. I'm proud to say it's from parenting and also the school system. Keep Walcott School. Um, I attended a, a captive insurance meeting in October here. You know, it's interesting, all the rooms full of adults and they're talking about K through second graders. The more rules you throw at them, the more outrages you get and outbursts they'd have. Guess what, putting them on buses, transferring them is more rules. Keep Walcott School. Uh, comments on your survey, you know, we haven't really brought it up. I know you can find the findings next meeting, but it was a joke, plain and simple. Uh, they talked about townships. I didn't know Walcott and Mount Pier was a township. I looked on your website, Google townships, Davenport district, nothing. So how do we get townships there? Correct me, maybe in your open round the table, you can discuss that. Um, also, personal thoughts on that survey, very incomplete direction given without honest answers to where Devon, Davenport Community School District is headed such as schools being affected and district borders. Um, last meeting, you mentioned that the state has forgiven the money amount. No dollar amount was given. So maybe in the round the table, somebody could throw out, see if it's that 400 million you're asking for on that survey. I doubt it, but that's a great deal. I appreciate all the hard work that was given to get that off of our plate. If we raise the elementary children to model Walcott in all of our schools, smaller classroom sizes, great teachers. It will carry over to middle schools, carry over to high schools, and guess what? The home front, adulthood. Uh, I'm all in favor of giving each child all the chances they need to graduate from high school. Keeping and fixing our elementaries is where it's most important. Teach them right, they'll do right. It may cost more dollars at the earlier ages, but will pay huge dividends when you see the graduation rates climb and climb. Maybe a few years from now, we won't need a mid-city high. We won't need, I believe it's the YAP program discussed at last meeting, because those kids are doing great. If we need them, fine. I'm not saying by correcting this is gonna solve everything 100%, but by teaching our elementary, keeping our schools open, it's gonna do that, and I'd like to end that let's fix the problems at the earlier stages in school. Model and celebrate Walcott K through eight school. Go Panthers. Lynette Tarchinski and Brenda Thrapp. Good evening, Lynette Tarchinski, 431 West Parkview Drive in Walcott. Um, tonight, I wanted to share something that happened on October 12th, just to give you a flavor of what might be affecting enrollment. And maybe you've already heard about it, and maybe you haven't. But on October 12th, all of the parents of kindergartners in Walcott got a note from their teachers saying that one of the second or the second kindergarten teacher was reassigned by the district yesterday to teach kindergarten at Garfield Elementary. That means her current students at Walcott will now be joining the other class for a total of 24 students. The children were told today that their classes will be combined tomorrow. And perhaps 24 is the okay number. That's the cutoff. That's what everybody said is okay. There were many, many, many comments about parents and children, but I thought this one really hit home. My son was in this class. The first thing he asked me was if he will ever get to see her again and how she cried and the students cried. They were given one day's notice that this was going to happen. The teacher who has left the district had to give the district 60 days notice that she was leaving. 
So this is something that affects the parents of the children. This could have a possible effect on enrollment. I just, I feel like sometimes we get this opinion that people are open enrolling because they didn't like the mask mandate and they didn't like this and they didn't like that, but maybe having these real life examples of how students and parents feel when something like this happens can give you a flavor of why the enrollment might be changing. Right now, the Davenport Community School District has 53 open jobs on their website. Bettendorf, five. Pleasant Valley, zero. North Scott, one. Des Moines, 34. So while this is still going on, we're still here fighting to keep our elementary here. We are overcoming this, we are committed, and we don't want our elementary to go away. Thank you. Good evening, Brenda Thrapp. I live at 15505 108th Avenue Place, Davenport. I've lived within a 20 mile radius my entire life. Um, I attended Wauquite and West. My husband attended Hayes, Smart, and West. My children started out at Fillmore for a couple years. We relocated to Wauquite and they finished at West. We have all are very well versed in the Davenport district and we all went on with successful careers and done well. Um, I have a different perspective somewhat tonight. Um, I traveled from Wauquite through Bluegrass to Buffalo for over 18 years while I worked my job of over 30 years in Buffalo. Um, those roads that I had to travel were often snowpacked, drifted. Uh, they're covered with frost. I've seen black ice. Um, it has narrow, rocky shoulders and deep ditches. I've witnessed cars catching an edge and spinning out in a ditch in front of me. Uh, and that was in the good weather. They're heavily traveled by trucks, farm equipment, and I see a caravan of parents driving their children back and forth every day, morning and night, because they don't want them to have to ride those buses for an hour each way. Uh, I cringe to think the public would think that putting a whole bunch of these little kids onto a bus is acceptable. Uh, and that to do it day after day after day. Safety should be our top priority at any cost. Following my accident, my husband and I now live at the west edge of Davenport. There's a huge difference in road conditions uh, near Davenport versus out between our rural communities. We love our new home. It's only six minutes from west. But I question and I wonder why, out of all the houses in our addition, the few that have children in it, very few go to, west, or to the Davenport schools. Uh, and that bothers me too. Um, we're very fortunate to be a part of the Davenport community. Um, I'd like to support the efforts to improve the conditions um, but it's more than the brick and mortar. I have also have seen those websites, um, but I've seen little discussion on the community impact. Um, it's more focused on empty seats. Walk it's vibrant with a solid base of support for your district, our district. It needs your support. Please retain that elementary school so we're sustainable. Walk it's special. I support those residents, the passionate residents, the business owners and organizations where people volunteer countless hours to make that a better place. I want to see Davenport flourish. I really do. Um, but please don't fail, Walcott. Uh, together, let's fix our issues, um, the ones that you're trying to address. But, you know, your, your rural attendance will follow. You know, it will. I'm a proud panther and falcon. So, but thanks for your time. Brandy Allen and Wade Warnicky. Hello. I'm used to talking in front of five-year-olds, so please forgive me if I'm nervous. Um, I am Brandy Allen, 220180 80th Avenue in Walcott. I have been with the Davenport District for 21 years. In those 21 years, I have taught at five schools. I was realigned twice out of my building as a new teacher because my grade level section was collapsed. My most recent teaching move was to Walcott, where I live and now raise my kids. 
They are still in preschool, but the plan was that I would drive them to the school where I also work, like so many other teachers at Walcott already do. But that wants to be, you want to take that away. If you close the elementary school, my children will be bused from my rural gravel road right past Walcott Elementary down into Bluegrass. That's a minimum straight shot of 20 minutes for my five and six year old. And I will go who knows where, teach who knows what, with what kind of schedule, I don't know, because now the junior high schedule works out great. My choice of living in Walcott and working at Walcott was deliberate. I love the country, I didn't want to be in the city, and I wanted my kids to have the best education possible. And Walcott offered all of that. Like Joe, I heard President Gosa say at the July 11th meeting that he chose his residence based on where he wanted his kids to go to school. We all make these decisions for our family with careful thought and planning, but now it seems that it was all for nothing. My house is one country block away from the North Scott boundary line. If you chose to close my school, why would I continue to send my kids to this district? My co-teacher at Walcott was just realigned a week and a half ago into Garfield after 35 days being with her kindergarten students. I now have a classroom full of 24 five and six year olds. I can guarantee you with absolutely no hesitation that the children in my classroom before we were combined were learning at a greater rate than ever before. I was able to focus on each individual child and teach them at their current ability. They're all over the place. My class size doubled overnight with no warning, and it is with great sadness that I admit that the children in my care are no longer able to get the same quality of education with little to no personalized attention now that there are 24 students. It's hard to get to me is what one student told his mom. If you choose to collapse an entire elementary school and send our classrooms to combine into schools, resulting in larger class sizes, learning will absolutely suffer. I can say unequivocally that a smaller class size creates the best learning situation for our students, and you want to take that away. As I watched the July 11th presentation, it's very complicated. I understand why people don't know uh, what's going to happen. In fine print, it states that Buchanan and Washington will be idle, meaning that they will close. So my question is, why aren't more of these families here? I believe it's because they don't know, not that they don't care. Buchanan and Washington, along with Walcott, will close regardless of which option is, is chosen. Correct me if I'm wrong. Walcott would close, Jackson would close, either Eisenhower or Harrison would close, Hayes or Monroe would close, Williams would close, Jefferson would close, Buchanan would close, Washington and Smart with possibly building new junior high school. That's a lot. But the two options that they presented, in my understanding, were not decided by the FMPC. Somewhere between the FMPC's recommendations to the cabinet and then to the board, uh, which Bray Architects presented, it changed. And it's my understanding that the options that were presented were not part of the discussion. So it seems that the FMPC was smoke and mirrors. Why did you ask for their advice for over the, the last year if you were gonna do something completely different? Another question I have is why architects who main, whose main motive as a business is to build and remodel so that they can make money, rightfully so. But why are they completing the capacity and utilization study? It's like having the fox guarding the hen house. Their capacity minimums are inflated and unrealistic. It's hard to fathom how 800 teenagers could reasonably fit into Walcott. I looked at the capacity study and our school map and there were uh, no rooms utilized for special ed in their, uh, in their projections. The weight room was even listed as being utilized at all points of the day. Bray spoke to us about having early childhood um, in our elementary schools and I think that is a fantastic idea. We need to reach out to children whose learning is most critical in the early years. But how are they going to fit into buildings if we're all smushed together? I'm almost done. A couple of things some other people already talked about. If Washington and Eisen if Washington closes and those students are sent to Eisenhower and McKinley, Eisenhower is one of two areas, including Bluegrass, that are, have projected population growth. But then it just becomes the only option is to build a new school, which is also good for Bray Architects. Um, just like out in Bluegrass, we could build a new school out, um, but my question is if you're prepared for a max, mass exodus of students if you choose to close Walcott, because that's what I'm hearing is what a lot of people want to do. Uh, the, last, the last thing is I believe that the two options that were made were made to be deliberately confusing so that people wouldn't ask too many questions, even though they've asked a lot. 
If we pick option two over option one, we are still closing three elementary schools, but that's better than five, so that makes us feel like it's the better option. But closing schools is never a good option. In my lifespan that I know of, six schools have already closed. So what is the district doing wrong? Why are families from Walcott flocking to Durant and not returning? They didn't leave the town, they just left the district. Did we bother to ask them why? What are we doing to attract and retain families in our district? And what have we done to realign boundaries so that schools have an equal amount of students? From what I have experienced, you are doing everything you can this year to make Walcott look less viable and worthy of closure. So let's take a look at other options before we decide that closing schools are the only option. In December, I'm asking you to not vote for any school closures. Table the idea of closing schools and spend more time genuinely, genuinely listening to the public, the families and the teachers, and seek to learn how we can make our schools better without the need to close our wonderful schools. The district is in the service of students, not architect firms, and you must do all that you can to ensure that you are listening and making the best choices for students. They are not capacity numbers. Thank you. Hello, I'm Wade Warnke. I live at 204 East James Street in Walcott. Last meeting, I talked about the information on your website uh, for this transitional period. And, um, you know, I, I discussed that it's a lot of information for someone to sit down. I sat down for about four or five hours to go through it all and deciphering it. I noticed that it's a lot of numbers and dollars, which I understand that's part, part of the reason, but there's nothing stating anything about educational impacts to children being moved or closures or the benefits of a K-4, K-5 plan or anything like that. Um, I'll, I'll lead into also, you know, the busing, which uh, Brenda touched, uh, touched about, busing a, a young child up to an hour one way, um, so a total of two hours a day. is just not acceptable for a young child and the dangers of the road as well. And then um, observing these meetings the last two or three months, uh, I've noticed that you know our you know our financials are in the, the right path. We're doing a good job, so congrats on that. But then the first thing we're doing is talking about closing schools. And then I also understand that we're trying to right size our district. We, we want to be prepared 10, 15 years from down the road as well. But why don't we try and promote our district? Why don't we try in, to increase those numbers to get those families back? And I'm going to lead into access to elementary schools. If we close these elementary schools, we're just deterring families from moving to those areas. Which families will want to look on Zillow and see, oh, two, three, ten miles away is an elementary school instead of a half mile? We're just going to further decline our population. And then there goes our dollars. And then we're going to close more schools. We're going to keep the cycle going. Um, I'd like to lead into... Um, I watched the July meeting when this committee brought this presentation to you, you all as a board. And they also stated that they would um, take in all the information from the online submittals and put up like a fact questionnaire. Um, I just, I just uh, looked at it half an hour ago. There's no information on there from all the questions that we've asked over the last four months. Um, and I'd like to end with um, looking at your survey in quote, this, this goal is to develop a facility improvement plan that reflects the priorities of our taxpayers. And I would argue that you've heard it the last two or three months here at these meetings, and you'll see it in two weeks with the results of the survey. Thank you very much. Austin Bowman and Dan Burnick. Hi there, Austin Bowman, 212 Brady Street, Devonport. Um, so I am here for two primary reasons, um, to not close the Walcott School. And me personally, I'm in support of the small business. I am a small business owner. Uh, I'm a personal trainer, gym owner in the town. Um, I was a long time resident in Walcott for a long time. My daughter is sixth grade currently, so um personally she's not going to be affected by these changes she will remain in walcott and then have to make that decision but a lot of her classmates and community members they are going to be affected 
And when that, I see that, that makes me have to show up here, right? Um, in support, <clears throat> because in our town, we are a small community, right? A sense of camaraderie. Um, we look after one another. And in my business, uh, the community that we have, we look after one another, right? Um, so long story short, uh, for the children, we want to make sure that the school for safety, right? A lot of these kids can walk to school currently, uh, busing to and from, as is stated, these roads can be pretty treacherous, right? I drive it to and from work from Davenport, it's rough. I get up at four to be at my gym by five and those roads sometimes aren't even plowed. So I know how treacherous they can be and the busing system is gonna work against that safety concern. Uh, relocating, uh, a lot of people have said here that if they don't have that value that Walcott currently has with the K through eight, they may look at relocating. And then personally, that is gonna affect my business, right? Um, so in turn, I wanna keep the value of the community and keep growing it rather than looking at pulling things away and decreasing the value of what we have currently. Um, just final thoughts, realistically, uh, I would like us to maybe look at some options that uh, maybe wouldn't affect the, the current K through eight, maybe look at uh, potential options. I know we had plan one and two. Um, I think we have room for maybe a third plan and that's keeping walkout open. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dan Burnick and I live at 417 South Emerald Court in Long Grove. I'm here tonight to express my concern about the proposed closing of Walcott Elementary School. I agree with the widely held belief that a decision to close Walcott Elementary will essentially tear the heart out of the community, affecting businesses, property values, and most of all, the kids and families who live there. My interest in this issue stems from my deep family roots to the Walcott community and Walcott School. I grew up there, went through elementary and junior high at Walcott School, as did all four of my siblings. Furthermore, my wife and I have owned rental property in Walcott for 30 plus years. Walcott Elementary is an extremely strong asset for the town. And Walcott students seem to be a bright spot for the district as their test scores consistently outpace the district average. There is tremendous school spirit and pride for the school as, as part of the Walcott community. Meanwhile, student enrollment in the Davenport School District has declined by more than 2,000 students over the past 20 years, and you've predicted decline for the next 10 years. It seems the Davenport School District's position is to accept these ongoing losses and decline and just right size or cut as necessary along the way. Many young families are attracted to the community of Walcott because of the school, yet I do not hear anyone who moves to the area or lives in the area so the kids can attend West High School. It's your job to figure out why that is, take steps to correct it, and make West High School a school that families want to send their kids to and even open enroll to. What is the plan to make every school in the Davenport School District a great, safe learning environment, each with a strong reputation that families are attracted to and want to remain in? Your challenge and opportunity is to offer schools with a track record and reputation that attracts and retains families to the Davenport School District. Doing so will attract and retain the best possible teachers, attract and grow businesses, boost property values and resulting property tax revenue, and ultimately money for the Davenport School District. Closing Walcott Elementary won't help that cause, just the opposite. It will accelerate the decline of the district as you bust young students to other locations, disrupt families, and alienate a community. You have enormous power and opportunity. Please stop accepting defeat and start charting a course for continuous improvement turnaround and growth for the Davenport Community School District. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments and concerns with Open Forum. And also I wanna thank little Miss Cora again. I appreciate 
how well she read and how articulate she was and for actually coming forward to speak on behalf of her school. Thank you. Now we're gonna take about five minute break. So um, please be back within about five minutes so we can get going. If everyone can please take your seats, we're ready to reassemble. Okay, thank you. May I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? Madam Vice President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the consent agenda as presented. May I have a second? Second. It's been properly moved by Director Beck and second yeah. by Director Gordon. Is there any discussion? I'll call for the vote. Director Beck? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. Director Kleintron? Yes. Director Poston? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion pass. A motion for the approval of bills. Madam Chairwoman? Director Poston? Move the board approve the following resolution. Resolved all claims presented to the board having been duly certified as correct by the treasurer, reviewed by the administration and board members. And they are hereby audited and allowed as just claims and warrants drawn on the treasury for the several amounts. For the resolved, the payment of claims and salaries be approved as presented for the period of October 5th through October 18th, 2022. Thank you, may I have a second? Second. It's been properly moved by Director Poston and second by Director Klein Drone. Is there any discussion? <laughs> Seeing as none, I'll call for the vote. Director Poston? Yes. Director Klein Drone? Yes. Director Beck? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion pass. Superintendent's report. Thank you. November 16th, uh, I would say around 11 ish because we never know where they're going to be in the state board agenda. We've been asked to give our final update to the state board of education. Um, we will be presenting in the areas of leadership, finances, special education, MTSS early literacy and PBIS supports and engagement. Um, I'm very proud of the work that the board and, and cabinet have done to move forward with our structure change under the area of leadership. Our board structures that we've put in place for monthly reviews of our, of our board meetings and, and com collaborating with IESB to provide professional developments along with goal setting um, has been a great benefit to us. I think the board moving forward with discussion and action, as you'll see tonight, um, in, in a regular cadence of our, of our meetings has been very helpful. And board committees um, to review monthly actions on a regular cadence have made a huge change in our leadership. In terms of our finances, we are, we are trending in the right direction. We have to continue to move forward as, as we, <clears throat> it is our responsibility to make sure that we are always financially um, positive. So the cadence for the which at which we review our finances at the board at the board table and inside of our own institution are incredibly important. Um, we've also been attacking this through a systemic way. So we look at on a monthly basis our financial reports and we have now added a, a an, an additional board committee, the board finance committee that reviews those finances and share those out on a monthly basis. In terms of special education, we are continuing to stay, uh, sustain our compliance measures. We're utilizing fidelity checks and providing professional development where necessary. Obviously, this is an area that we continue to grow as we are, as we are revisiting our continuum of supports. MTSS early literacy and PBIS, those are probably the biggest areas for us as, as we have been reporting out on the progress in our early literacy sections. 
95%. So some of the initiatives in this area that we will be reporting out on um, are 95% implementation, letters training for our teachers. Um, we've hired additional reading interventionists. Um, we also, in both of these areas, have core teams tracking um, the progress of the initiatives, and it also flows through our structure um, of our instructional leadership directors with through our, through our buildings and our collaborative teacher teams. Um, in terms of PBIS, we have a core team as well looking at the district-wide implementation of this. One of the biggest things that we are looking at this year is our common expectations, what majors versus minors and building expectations uh, and, and district-wide expectations. Um, if, for the area of engagement, um, we are, we are constantly trying to discuss the cascade and the cadence at which we do that through our, through our buildings and our community, establishing routines with local city officials um, to, to make sure we're discussing key initiatives. Uh, we, we've heard back from one of our city, we, we currently have a meeting established with Davenport and we've, we've heard back from the town of Walcott to re routinely meet with them uh, on an every other month basis. Um, we are utilizing surveys to give feedback to our community. So those are some of the highlights that we will share um, at the state board meeting for the 16th at about 11-ish o'clock. That concludes my report. Thank you so much for that um, committee reports. And I would like to defer the data wall to Superintendent Snecklaw. So we have the proposal for additional screens in here, which will have dual utilization for our, our midday meetings, but will also display the board's uh, goal for data. Until, I wanna remind the board that until the data wall is up and running of what we're utilizing, we're gonna continue to do the monthly cadence like, like we did for the conditions for learning. So we currently have a cadence for how we're reviewing data, but this data wall will, will put it in the forefront all the time for us to make sure that we're focusing on the right things, which is the outcomes for students. Um, Courtney, Diane, and myself have been charged um, with reviewing this. We have visited with other local superintendents. Um, we, are, we are beginning to dig into those data points. We are also partnering with Judy Elliott to help us define these, making sure that we're looking at this through an equity lens and, and ensuring that we have that outside expert helping us with that. So we're very excited about that. We, have, uh, we will be scheduling a, a board data wall committee here very soon, Vice President. Thank you. Finance Committee? Uh, we met last week and reviewed our finances, uh, also looked at um, the spending of our ESSER dollars, and then we also looked at um, our negotiations timetable. Legislative advocacy? So we will be scheduling our meetings with our local electeds for December, I believe it is here very shortly. And then Bruce, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I just wanted, we uh, discussed a little bit about the surveys and the results are coming in and want to, people to understand that the survey is, it's a planning tool for the board. It's to help us in our decision-making. It's to give us input. We have decided nothing. Okay. I mean, I know we say that all the time and I know there's somebody out there saying, oh no, oh no, we have decided nothing. I mean, if you want ignorant people when it comes, no. But it, there's a, a whole bunch of possibilities that we're looking at. There's two pathways, but embedded in those pathways are a number of decisions and choices. That's like dominoes. And so, you know, as I, when I say we haven't decided anything, it's important that we get back the information from the public because your input has been very important and the general public's input is very important because we're looking to set upon a, a, a direction that's going to create positive learning experiences and opportunities for all of our kids in every building. It's not designed to say, well, this building, it's designed to raise the level of the whole district and provide us the financial security to be able to do that. Buildings cost money to operate. They just do. And we've, we, you've, you read this survey. We, we all know. We talk about right sizing. You know, we have 3,000, we, three, we have room for 3,000 more kids. But we don't have 3,000 more kids, but we're maintaining space for 3,000 more kids. You know, if you had a 10 bedroom house and you had 10 kids, you're happy. 
in 20 years, you got a 10 bedroom house and it's you and your husband. Who's cleaning all that? That's all I got to say. Thank you, Director Potts. Ilziak? We had our first meeting um, last Tuesday, and we kind of, well, TJ went over, or Director, Superintendent Schneckloth, I'm doing good today, <laughs> went over our district priorities of early literacy, PBIS, and CRVP, um, and then we kind of went back and forth with our community partnerships. We had representatives from the AEA, Eastern Iowa Community College, colleges, I don't know, Family Resources, YMCA, among some others. Um, and we discussed some ways to get our district accomplishments and celebrations out to the public. It was productive, and I should have more to report next time. Thank you very much. Long-range facility planning? That was Bruce's report. You combined them. Policy committee? Um, we have a number of policies up um, for approval tonight that are number changes, and that is because we are getting much closer to switching our numbering system from the arbitrary system that we had been using for a long time to one that aligns with the IASB. Um, and I, it's been a while since I said this um, out in the public. So basically the reason we're doing this is whenever there are legislative changes or um, other changes to policies that uh, school districts need. The IASB sends out templates and provides um, support for those changes. And so by having a numbering system that is uh, consistent with theirs, it makes it a lot easier for us to make sure that we are not missing anything whenever something changes. And so tonight we have a ton of policies. We have already voted on these policies as far as their content, but we have to switch their numbers so we're not duplicating things. So that's what's happening with us right now. Thank Could you. I just say, I'd like to give a big shout out to Brenda who has had to do all of these rewrites and number changes and it's gotta be a huge headache, but I really appreciate all the time you put into this. Thank you so much to each one of you for your reports and the work that you do on these various committees. Now we'll move to action items. May I have a motion for the 23-24 um, high school course guide? Madam Vice President. Director Beck. I move that the school board approve the 2023-24 high school course guide as presented. May I have a second? been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Call for the vote. Director Beck? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director klein -Jerome? Yes. Director Poston? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion passed. May have a motion for the use of Leggett Architects for the Central High George Marshall Gym Roof Replacement Project. Madam Vice President. Director Potts. I move the board approve the contract with Leggett Architects for the design of the 2023 Central High George Marshall Gym Roof Replacement Project in the amount of $62,250. May have a second? Second. It's been properly moved and second. Is there any discussion? Um, I do have a question. Okay, when I, and Josh could answer this hopefully, when I replace a roof on my house for whatever reason, I just hire roofers that come. Why are we hiring an architect? Are we changing the pitch of it? Or it's still a flat roof, it's the same thing. Why, why do we need an architect? Uh, to set a standard so uh, a contractor can just show up and Maybe one will go up a wall six inches, one might go up four inches. One might use a smaller mill, one will use a thicker mill. Um, they'll propose different things if we don't hire somebody to uh, set a standard for them to go off of. So you could hire somebody to do your roof on your house and get a really low grade of shingle on your house or you get a high grade. Um, there's a lot of ranges there, so you, you would have specify with them how to do it and what you want used. So these companies are hired to 
make sure that's out there and hold them accountable. Okay, thank you. Any additional discussion, Director Posture? I'll ask the same question I asked last meeting. Now, are these the only architects that can do roofs? No, and I um, addressed that with some staff from my I have, and we're gonna we're gonna put them out for bid on the projects coming for the roofs. And then in some of the language, it looks to me like we're just giving a blank check. I mean, if they run into any problems, they're going to uh, add on to this. Um, quote that they have I don't believe so okay. I think I think in the future we definitely need to have a quote because I again I just don't like to be sitting here and just you know we're just primed for being picked off you know by these firms we've got to have a bidding process Any additional discussion? We'll call for the vote. Director Potts? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. Director Beck? Yes. Director Klein's wrong? Yes. Director Pasha? No. And my vote is yes. Motion passed. May I have a motion for the Fillmore Gym return fan replacement? Madam Vice President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the contract with Train US Inc. be approved by the board, uh, be approved to upgrade and repair the Fillmore Gym air handler for the amount of $41,304 to be completed in the 2022-23 school year. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. It's been properly moved and second. Is there any discussion? Seeing as none, call for the vote. Director Beck? Yes. Director Klein's room? Yes. Director Posture? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Gordon? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion passed. May I have a motion for the policy approval? Madam Vice President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the following policies. Brenda, do I actually have to read all the numbers? Okay. Policy 400, policy 704.03, policy 706.01. The next set are number changes only. Seven zero five point zero five, seven zero five point zero six, seven zero five point zero five, 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 seven zero five point zero
baseball field at Brady Stadium to Bill Freeze. Superintendent's next call. Turn it over to Mr. Flynn. Good evening. Uh, the there was a player at Central High School um, who started the process of wanting to name the field after Bill Freeze, um, and the the school uh, followed through by. Uh, following the board process for naming a facility um, and are recommending that the baseball field located at Brady Street Stadium be named the Bill Freeze Field in honor of Coach Freeze. Um, on the information sheet, you'll notice that uh, Coach Freeze was the, the baseball coach at Central from 1961 to 1986. During that time, uh, won four state titles, finished second three times. Uh, had a record of 518 wins and 219 losses. Um, selected to, as district coach of the year four times, Iowa coach of the year in 1975. Um, national high school district coach of the year twice and was named the national coach of the year in 1980. Um, also elected in the Iowa Baseball Coaches Hall of Fame, the Quad City Sports Hall of Fame, and the Davenport Schools Ring of Honor. Um, I think most tellingly, the letters of support that were included in that packet talked about what his mentorship meant to them, not only as youngsters growing up playing the sport of baseball, but as men as they grew up. And just uh, the positive impact that not only Coach, but his wife Sherry also um, had on them as they grew up. So there are just hundreds and hundreds of kids, men now, uh, that played for Coach Freeze that uh, thought the world of him. And that led to the nomination, uh, the petition, and all of the information that's attached. Thank you. Any discussion, questions? You know, Vice President? Director Potts? Yeah. Um, I know Bill, and uh, this is a great honor and a very appropriate honor for him. Anything more? Okay, moving to item 12.02, naming Central High School Wrestling Room for Simon Cy Roberts. Superintendent Snackcloth. Mr. Flynn. Thank you, Superintendent Snackcloth. Um, a second nomination came in uh, to, to name the wrestling room at Central High School after Simon Roberts and to name uh, the wrestling room to Simon Roberts Wrestling Room. Uh, the nomination itself included a lot of information. I'm going to highlight some of that, and then I'm going to go into some of the research that I did because I was fascinated by what I read um, about this individual. Um, he was an accomplished wrestler both at Davenport High School and later at the University of Iowa. He was the first American, I'm, excuse me, first African American athlete to win a state championship in wrestling in 1954, and was later first African American to win the national championship at the University of Iowa in 1957. Uh, Mr. Roberts then returned to the Quad Cities, was involved in coaching, was the first African-American head coach in the Quad Cities over at Rock Island Allman, was involved in politics, was involved in community service as well, including being the founding director of Project Now. Uh, truly was a pioneer. He was a member, of, uh, is a member, I'm sorry, of the Iowa Wrestling Hall of Fame, the Glenn Brand Hall of Fame, the National Wrestling Hall of Fame at the Dan Gable Museum, the University of Iowa Hall of Fame, the Iowa State High School Wrestling Hall of Fame, of which he was the first African American member um, elected, the Iowa Foundation Hall of Fame, the Quad City Times Sports Hall of Fame, and an honoree uh, also in the Davenport Central Hall of Honor. A few other pieces. Um, Mr. Roberts was the first African-American voted into public office in Davenport as the Parks Commissioner. Uh, he was the first African-American president of the University of Iowa Letterman's Club. Uh, he's a director of adult education at Black Hawk College. He was a TV producer, including two different programs that uh, help disadvantage and disenfranchise parts of the community, including the Opportunity Line and Like It Is. Um, and quite frankly, it's just somebody, the more I read about, the more I wanted to read about because it was just, it's a fascinating life that he has lived. So he is truly a role model uh, that the students at Davenport Central High School can look up to. That was awesome. Thank you. Any discussion? Director Beck? So is the wrestling room where the wrestling team competes or is it a practice room? It's a practice room. The meets themselves are held in George Marshall Gym. 
In where? Which George Marshall gym, which abuts the wrestling room. So there's actually a place in the gym where it could be notated as well, which would okay. be an important piece. Because I was going to say, based on the his credentials, I don't want to see his honor relegated to a room that only the wrestling team gets to see. So I think it would be important to make sure that everyone can see. I mean, everything you described is just fascinating. And I think it's a really important part of our history to include, to make sure that everybody understands it or sees it. Any additional discussion? Jackson? Just wanted to get this out of the way real quick. I, <clears throat> when I was a lot younger, I'd always thought that uh, when I first moved here, the Davenport was just kind of this, you know, boring place in some state no one's ever heard of. And more and more, I realized that we have some amazing history that a lot of other places in this country do, do not get to uh, do not get to claim. And that, <laughs> but both um, this this story and uh, oh my goodness, what was the other one? Uh, why can't I find it? Bill Freese, thank you. Um, Bill Freese, like, but both of those stories, just absolutely beautiful, amazing, and uh, yeah, I hope uh, I hope when it comes time to you guys, uh, let this go through because this looks absolutely beautiful. Turn off. <laughs> Any additional discussion, Director Potts? Yeah, um, I think I'm Methuselah here, but I knew Cy Roberts <laughs> as a parent of kids that were in my class when I was teaching at Sudlow, uh, and a wonderful gentleman, a wonderful gentleman, and he was a wonderful parent because his kids were stellar, stellar individuals, and it was always my pleasure to be connected with them in some way. I knew some of those kids also. <laughs> Okay, thank you all for your comments. Any additional? Okay, moving Can on. I, oh, I just direct it back. One more comment in just reading the uh, quotes here. I have to say, we hear this in incredible life story of Mr. Roberts and <laughs> the quote here about him entering his wrestling, wrestling career at Central High School. I started wrestling because a couple of my buddies talked me into it. Um, as a sophomore, I wrestled 120 pounds and did okay. I didn't get to wrestle much. Like the most understated quote for someone with such an illustrious career. What a humble person. So anyway, I think a well-deserved honor. Okay, following up on our September 26th meeting, we discussed the book study the governance core and also miseducated. What are our feelings on that? Are we gonna move forward with it or are we going to table the book study for now? I'm just go around the table and see what our feelings are. Start with Director Gordon. And also a choice of a book as well. Well, the lazy part of me wants to say, let's do Miseducated because I've already read it and I thought it was fascinating and it would be great to talk about and I don't want to put more work in right now, but also I do want to read the governance core. Um, I have not been a part of any kind of book study in since I've had kids, so like 17 years or something, so I don't know how well I'm going to do staying on a schedule, but I'm willing to try. Okay, Director Potts. Yeah, I, as I say, I, I've read Fleming's book. Uh, which we got last year, and it's mm -hmm. it provides a lot of good conversational pieces in it. I obviously I haven't read the governance core, which doesn't exactly sound exciting. <laughs> so, I think I'd go to Brandon's book. Okay, Director Beck. I have to say, if I were choosing based on books, I would be interested in discussing. Um, Miseducated is definitely the one that tops my list. Um, but in terms of forcing me to read something that I might not otherwise read but could really benefit from, uh, the governance core. But I am all in on book study, so I'm happy happy to do that. And I think um, we could have some really great conversations, particularly about miseducated. Director Posture. 
I read Miseducated. Uh, I guess I'm not ready to read another book right now during harvest, but maybe during the winter. I respect that. Director Kleindrow? Yeah, Miseducated. I also have read it, so I'd go for that one. <laughs> And I, too, have been in this education. And what we'll do is, I guess we can make the decision, do we want to discuss it by chapters or just kind of give a little synopsis of our feelings on the book? But think about that, and we will take it to the agenda committee that we will do the miseducated and schedule a time for it to be on the agenda that we can have that discussion. Okay. Board policies for the board's second discussion. Director Beck? Um, yeah, so these are second discussion, uh, 408.01, um, 603.05, and 605.02. And as far as I know, although I haven't checked my email today, um, <laughs> <laughs> We haven't gotten any feedback since the last discussion. And so unless anybody has anything else to add, we will see these for approval at our next regular meeting. Okay, with our discussion items, as usual, if there's any additional information that you'll need for a vote at our next regular meeting, which would be November 8th, maybe? 7th, 8th? Well, for our next board meeting, if there's any additional information that you need, please see Superintendent Schneckloff so we can answer all the questions that you may have. And Director Beck, if you have any questions regarding the policies, and I will take any questions that you'll have regarding the book study. Thank you all for your input. Administrative report. None at this time. Board requests. I only have one, and it is from Director Postion. The date of the request is 10-24-22, both agenda item and request for information. When will the board be updated on actions to overall fighting in the schools? Why are you making this request? Two months of the school year have gone by, and nothing has changed. We don't need a study on fighting in schools. We need actions. Staff in the schools need more support, and we need to come down hard on these students. When would you like this? This needs to be more respect now given to our teachers and staff. May I have a second? Second. It's been seconded by Director Potts. Thank you for that. We'll move to board reflections, starting with Director Kleindrom. Um, I also read the article on the front page of the paper. It's nice to see that our students are um, the green team, and I like the fact that it's all three high schools, you know, are putting it out there and organizing these events. I thought it's good for them that they're thinking in the future and the environment. Um, I also appreciate the fact, student board members, that you highlight the fine arts. It's not just sports teams, although yay West High, um, as alumni, I can say. Good job, football team. Um, but I like to hear about the fine arts, too. So it's nice that you also highlight um, that area, because that also is very important. Dr. Poshin. I'd like to echo uh, Karen's thoughts. I, I, I appreciate the time uh, and the commitment that you have made as, as uh, student board members. I, I know it's not an easy thing to do to, to come to these meetings, and uh, um, so I appreciate that. And again, I appreciate the input from the community um, again, uh, you're, you're taking your time out from your busy schedules to come here and show your support and uh, appreciate that. Director Beck. 
Um, yeah, I um, appreciate the, feed the feedback from the community and then also um, hearing from our student board members and also uh, their willingness to participate in our conversations. Um, I also just want to say I, I really love the fact that we have a chance to honor um, former coaches and alumni with names and tell some really good stories um, about people that uh, we might not otherwise hear that much about especially for me, somebody who didn't grow up here. Um, it's, I'm constantly fascinated by the, the incredible history that we have. So I um, love the fact that we can honor people in that way. Director Gordon. I really appreciated our presentation tonight on the uh, complaint and grievance process. I think that having that transparency out there for everyone to um, know how it works is a uh, positive for our community. Dr. Potts. Yeah. The highlight for me is when we talk about Coach Freeze and Coach Roberts and recognizing them. Uh, and, you know, we talk about you're reading the quote about uh, Cy and uh, it, it's the power of a coach that got him because some coach walked down the hallway and said, you should go out for wrestling. And the rest, you know, the rest is history. Uh, and I don't want to be a downer, but this, to me, there's a little sad side to size recognition that his son's not going to be there because I, I miss him. He was a... Landon, do you have anything to add? Uh, I'd just like to offer my appreciation for the presentation uh, that we began with uh, on the complaint and grievance process. I'm continuously glad that equity is valued here in the school district. Uh, you don't, you do not see that everywhere, but you do see that here. Uh, I'd also like to um, say that I appreciate the comments made during open forum. As a student of science, I find value in ideas that are both strong and sound. And in this room, I've had front row seat to many ideas already that fit that description exactly. So thank you to the community, to the parents, and also to the nervous children for sharing what you, uh, sharing your voice. And uh, finally, I'm glad I'm not the only one here lacking motivation and time to read a book. I have, <laughs> I have been trying to read War and Peace since sixth grade, and I stop at 300 pages every year. So. <laughs> Like and that is all I have. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jackson. Oh, how do I top that? Um, <laughs> so first off, I just random compliment Potts. I don't know what you do. You put off the best energy whenever you talk. I just want to thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, kind of piggybacking off Landon. Um, yeah, that, that complaint guy, I, one of the things, one of my sort of grievances uh, kind of through elementary school uh, mostly was that uh, it was kind of my, my, my smaller brain didn't really kind of understand how the whole process worked. So really getting an in-depth sort of view on how this whole process works um, is, is very enlightening and it puts a lot of confidence in the, uh, a lot more confidence in the system than I've, I've, I've had. Um, and then also just the course guide. Thank, thank God for that getting passed here. So I, I stand by what I said. The whole passing it at the end of the year was very stressful. Um, and then just two, two quick final things. Um, I think, uh, Beck, you might agree with me on this, that perhaps, perhaps we need to pass a, uh, something where you don't have to read all those numbers. Uh, if it exceeds more than like five, that'd be amazing. <laughs> um, and then my last thing, uh, to posture, I just want to, um, I'll try to keep this brief. I don't know how much I should say on this, but just thanking you for that board request on, on the fights. I'll say personally, it's uh, gotten a bit stressful having to hear about that at least once a, well, like once a week. I think I've, I've been hearing it. So thank you for uh, wanting to get something done about that. Superintendent Schneckloff. The, the presentation that you had, um, I hate to celebrate this, but I'm going to. The process that Jamie has put in place and the the structure of solving the issues where they belong to be solved with the heart, um, that's different. And we're, we, in, in your arrival, 
um, our attorney passes along things that get to an attorney level and they are drastically reduced. Um, and, and I give that credit to a lot of trying to change why we're not perfect, why we um, have a long way to go. Uh, I applaud that. And it was it was evident to see that the transparent and through that um, I I am incredibly moved um, by the two coaches that we're honoring today. Um, I know my life was greatly impacted by the coaches that I had, and I and I can't imagine having those two gentlemen as a as a as a coach to inspire me. So those are my two big takeaways. And mine were the open forum. I love the community input to see what everyone has today. We sit here, and sometimes you don't hear all of the stories or know it or hear it firsthand, and I enjoy the open forum reports as well as the community input to include the coaches, you know, to have rooms and the baseball field named after them. It's kind of a wonderful legacy that continues to live on, and I'm excited about that. And I was also happy with the number of student board members that showed up tonight. I think we had representation from everyone tonight. The only thing I would ask differently is sometimes when we start talking, everyone can't see your name tags. If you can say who you are and from what school, that's helpful as well. But I appreciate hearing the reports and hearing your enthusiasm and literally trying to cover everything that's going on in the district. So kudos to you all for that. With that, I'll entertain a motion, Mr. Potts. So move. A second. All in favor? Aye. I call this meeting an adjournment.